So we are going to uh, discuss that video. Um, unfortunately, people kind of take comedians like Freaky Gervais, and they have him as like these um, authority figures, I guess, where if they say it in a joke, which is meant to conjure people to laugh, they just kind of accept it as fact. You see people do this with Rick and Morty all the time, right? Oh, Ricky, Rick is supposed to be this really smart character. Therefore, the things that he says about, you know, God and all these different things are absolutely true. And it's like, well, maybe you should actually think for yourself and research for yourself. Um, so one of the things that you kind of see is this kind of contradiction of morality. What is morality? You know, R Ricky is in, in, in this video. He's talking about all this different stuff about God. Why don't you kill Satan? So it's like, well. So obviously, killing is 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 okay to, to Ricky, right? So if we don't like what's what's happening, we can just kill people, and uh, then it's okay to mock other people for their beliefs and different stuff like that. So it's like okay, so what uh, what is the line of morality then if it's okay to do all these things? So let's let's look at the different questions he asked. You don't have to ask God these questions. You can just read the Bible and kind of find the answer. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven. First off, before we even get going though. Um, there is kind of an important aspect that that is important whenever we're looking at atheists and their complaints against God, which Ricky Gervais is an atheist, if you guys didn't know that. Um, one thing that's incredibly important whenever you're whenever you're talking with with atheists a lot and whatnot is that you don't forget a very simple fact, and that. That is that God isn't subject to us. He he doesn't he's not he's not he doesn't have to answer to us. He's not lower than us. And there's this whole attitude um, that atheists have, and um, well, I'm sure you picked up on it in the video. You know, the whole God idea is just stupid. It's just stupid. It makes way more sense that everything just appeared, and that when everything just appeared, that then life just started all all by itself, and then from that life, consciousness just sprouted and that just makes sense you know that's yeah and uh, all the different ways in in, in life and, and science and everything that prove god such as the laws of the universe oh no no it just just so happened it just poof and it, you know little things like that and it's like well you know when we're talking about these kinds of things it, it's it, it's good in a way to not close yourself off but remember that a lot of very well-meaning christians have fallen away from their faith when they didn't take the proper precautions. Um, what I mean by that is, I can watch this atheist make fun of God and it won't affect me. I can watch his show and it won't affect me. Maybe it won't affect me. And then over time, it does start affecting me. It does affect how you believe in God and how you trust in God. And it does affect the fact that, well, maybe you don't really believe in miracles like you used to. Maybe you don't really believe in the Holy Spirit moving like you used to. And it's like, oh, no, no, I'll be fine. It's like, well, you know, that's not true. Paul even talks about this when he says, hey, bad company corrupts good morals. Like, it's it's something where if you subject yourself to something, you can't be surprised at the effect. I, another area that this comes up in all the time is people, especially Christians, getting involved in demonic activity, then being surprised at the results of the demonic in their house. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't have problems. I was just talking to Isaiah about this the other day. I don't have problems in my house with, you know, seeing things and, and, and demonic presences and, and evil evil feelings in the household and people waking up with nightmares. And Why don't we have that? Because we don't allow demonic things in our house. People can laugh at me all that they, all that they want for the movies and, and music and all kinds of stuff that I don't allow in my house. But at the end of the day, my family is protected by Jesus. Now, if I invite something in, how far does that protection go from Jesus? As far as I allow it to. See, when I start allowing things to get into my house, I can't be surprised. That, oh, bad things are happening. Oh, surprise. It's like, no, it's not that big of a surprise. Um, I'll give you another example. There was some people, false prophets, that came to the church. And I very much so, I don't use that word very often, those words very often, false prophets. They very much so were. And a word was specifically given um, about how they were false false prophets, and um, some people in the church decided to keep hanging out with them. Just, yeah, no, you know, just do whatever you want. Okay, fine. So they went ahead and did it. They all ended up getting sick and getting physical problems that, that surfaced within that month that were persistent problems that did not go away. Some of them that I know 
are still dealing with those physical problems that came up. These are things you don't mess around with. When God says, hey, don't touch, you don't say, yeah, okay, I hear what you're saying, but... And so, you know, when you're watching things, I, I understand that Ricky Gervais and other, other atheists can be funny at times, I understand that, but you really do need to be careful with what you allow in your life and what you allow in your... I, I'm, think, think, step back and just think about this with me, okay? So I don't have time to read the Bible or pray, but I can watch an atheist be very negative towards Christianity, my belief in God. And it's not going to affect me, even though I'm not praying and reading the Bible. Think, just step back and think about that. Does that make sense? Does, does that realistically make sense that I can allow myself to be subjected to that and it's not going to affect me? So first off, God isn't subject to us. Even when we get to heaven and we've been, we have the resurrected body, God is still isn't subjected to, to us. Some people think that we're going to get to heaven and we're just going to like have this like Q&A time with God. Like, okay, God, I put up with that bull crap that you had me uh, go through now. Now you need to, now you owe me some answers. Like, okay, take a step back. First off, that's not how things are going to play at all. When we get to heaven, I, I think there's going to be a severe realization and, and humility that comes with that and humbleness that comes. I think we're going to live eternity in humility, not in exaltation. And what I mean by that is we're not going to step in front of God Almighty and say, we're going to be more like, you kind of get the difference of perspective there. Then the next thing, um, Satan will be punished. That's not, sometimes the question is, well, well, is God really that good? And, you know, what about Satan? I'll say, Don't jump to the end of the story. Satan will be punished, but not yet. So we'll get, I'll talk about that in just a second. His first real question that he asked before he kind of built on the main question, why, why, why does chocolate kill dogs? Well, th this isn't that good of a question. I'll explain what I mean. Every species has things that they personally are intolerant of. Every species. So there are some things that animals can eat that we can't eat or we get sick. That's just the fact of life. We all have different, a different physical makeup. And because of those different physical makeups, he made us into different creatures. Those different creatures can tolerate different things. He didn't make us all to be the same. So if you'll notice, how many, how many animals with consciousness are there? One, almost all animals have personality and have, you know, intelligence, but none of them have consciousness and, and moral guidance except for us. We're the only ones. How many, how many can be saved from sin? Well, only one because there's only one who can actually sin. Us. <laughs> Cats can't sin, like, right? You guys understand that, right? They can't be like... No, I reject you, Jesus. Meow. Like it's, it's just, it, that just can't happen. Um, so some intolerances exist within a species. So, for instance, some people can eat gluten and others can't. That's within the same species. There are variations. So to deny it and and just flip and flip it and say why did why did God make make child? And I understand it was a joke, but the thing is, behind that joke was an attitude of an atheist who hates God. So I feel like it's kind of like you can feel the animosity. Right, right. And he always says this, says this in the show. He says, oh, I, you know, I, I just go on whichever side will make people laugh. Like if, you know, if, it, if I have to make fun of gay being, uh, homosexuality being wrong, then I'll do that. Or if I have to do with right, I'll do that. And it's like, yeah, you say that, but you don't really mean it because you, you talk differently when you're talking about things that you are behind and things that you're not behind. Um, so then also the, the third thing here, and I don't know why I went three, uh, different uh, anatomies have different problems with different things. So the question you have to ask yourself is, do you just not want dogs? Like, do you, do you wish God wouldn't have made dogs? Well, no, of course I wish God made dogs. Well, so then gods have uh, dogs have different anatomies than, than people do, and different anatomies respond differently to different um, to different things. And so then the question becomes, why didn't God just make super beings that didn't have a problem with anything okay so first off we're in a fallen creation not in a resurrected creation second off they've scientists have d dedicated a lot of time trying to disprove god by saying that our bodies could have been made more perfect than they are but what they've actually found is that if one aspect of our body had been improved upon it would cause a deficit in another area so all that time and energy that scientists 
put to trying to make God look stupid and, oh, we should have made our bodies better in this way. It would have actually made it better in that way, yeah, but then worsen it in this other way. I can't give you a whole bunch of examples right now because it's kind of a whole long thing, but I would highly recommend um, Stephen C. Meyer was, would, would be one. He's a very intelligent man. Um, who else can I think of that talks about that kind of stuff? Uh, Lee Strobel actually has a book that we went through um, probably a couple of years ago now. Um, something about the creator... That's the one, and he uh, he has kind of has a has a chapter in there where he's interviewing someone who talks about that. So if you're interested in it, definitely want to check that out. So then the next question he asked, which was supposed to be a pro-gay argument, why is the Mel G spot you know up there? There there's a few things that he didn't really take into account, because this is actually kind of a stupid point, and I'll try to I'll try to go through the most important aspects, but there are other things worth saying. First off. Men are extremely sensitive in their genitalia. Women are not. So, like, for instance, when women have their pants rubbed against them, it does not, virtually nothing. When a man has even the slightest move of his pants against his genitalia, it causes arousal. It's just something that happens in men that doesn't happen in women. Men are more prone to sexual sins and sexual things because they're more, you know, they're more about... Look at, look at how men and women do porn. It's totally different, right? Women tend to do something that's more about em emotions, more about connecting with someone, more about a story. They're more likely to stay home reading those r romance novels, for instance. Men, not so much. Men don't really care about that kind of stuff. They just care to have boobs and a butt. And then that's fine. You know what I mean? Like, guys can get off to virtually anything. Virtually anything. And, and there's an Eminem song that says it like this, I'll F anything that walks. And that's pretty, pretty typical of a male attitude. So men are overly sensitive sexually and don't really need any extra stimulation. It's not like they, they need that. So the exception of the, of the G-spot isn't really that big of a deal. You know. Um, then the, then the, the thing I want to say about this, you'll notice that there's a little, little mark there after the stimulation. Um, the exception I would say to this is, is when men get, um, get sex dependence. And what that comes from is when they uh, look, at, look at porn and uh, are subjected to too much sexuality, it kind of burns them out. Um, and then they require extra stimulation because they burn themselves out, uh, which that's just kind of a desensita desensitization issue, not really an issue with how they were made. So it's kind of worth pointing out there. Uh, the next point that I want to make about this whole G-spot issue, the fact that something can be used for a purpose doesn't mean that that's its only purpose. So I've, I've compiled a list of things that tradi traditionally have been used for multiple things, okay? Marijuana, everybody now knows about smoke marijuana, but marijuana actually has a lot of different uses to it. Yeah. Right. Um, so rope, paper, I mean, clothing, it, it really has a wide variety of uses. It's only in the modern day that its, that its only use has been smoking. Well, yeah, okay, but I mean, it has all these other uses. Trees, well, trees are, trees exist to give us oxygen. Well, yeah. But they also provide a lot of other things that are very important. Um, their roots uh, uh, prevent erosion as quickly. They, they slow down the process of erosion. Their fruit sustains us. Um, we can use them for firewood. We can use them to make books. We can use them to make toilet paper. Trees have a, a plethora of uses. Or just look at coca leaves, right? Everybody knows coca leaves being used for cocaine. But does that mean that God made it to be used for cocaine? See what I mean? Just because something can be used for a purpose doesn't mean that that's its only purpose. So the essential argument of what Ricky is saying is that the prostate has one purpose. For the five-second orgasm of a man, as compared to the 30-second orgasm of a woman, the five-second orgasm of a man is somehow the only purpose of the prostate. Really? Like, is that is that really your argument? So just because the prostate can increase pleasure during a, a, an orgasm, does that mean that that's its primary use? No, not at all. So, you know, one of those things that kind of doesn't really fit the data. Uh, but there, but there, wait, there's more. Another thing is that prostate stimulation doesn't actually require anal penetration. This is a medical fact. 
You do not have to stick a finger up there or a penis up there. It does not require that. It doesn't. You can stimulate the prostate from the outside of your body as well. So the real question is why would you choose to stick something up there instead of doing it the other way? Doesn't that seem less natural? <laughs> Isn't it pretty defined by nature that the poop shoot is for the poop to shoot? I mean, doesn't that, that make sense, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not alone here, right? So you know, the, just a really simple, simple thing there. Um, the Bible also allows for experimental sexual pleasures during the context of marriage. There was a movement. Um, I don't really want to get into the history of it, but the idea was it was that the only biblical sexual position that could be done that wasn't sinful was missionary, and then if it was anything else, it was a sin against God. Yeah, and um, you know, it, it, even nowadays there's still some Christians who hold to this, and it's like, well, okay, like if you, that's that's fine, but now God does give us a lot of rules about sex. But what people don't understand is that there are also rules for marriage too, married sex too. So some of the rules, I've compiled a list of five that apply between a man and a woman. These are five rules that apply between apply with sex between a man and a woman. First off, you're married. Second off, no one's getting hurt. So um, I should elaborate on this. I don't mean the initial loss of virginity because that almost always hurts the female. So that's not really what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about no hurting, I'm talking about like S and M, hitting on each other. In fact, uh, psychologists have have shown us and, and and taught us some very important things about S and M. Typically, people who not typically, almost not almost every time that someone draws pleasure from hurting someone else sexually or from being hurt sexually, like that causing a sexual release. There is some very serious mental trauma there that definitely should be they, they should get some help definitely uh, that's one of the one of the things that people who know and then read books like Fifty Shades of Grey it's very disturbing for them because they deal with people and what that actually means and uh, well anyways so you're married no one's getting hurt uh, third off there's no one else in the bed it's supposed to be kept pure between the man and the woman the married couple that's it um, fourth off both willing um, there's there, there shouldn't be um, the rape and for a lot of time in church history the men were actually allowed to rape their wife their rape their wives um, if they weren't willing to just kind of force them into it not not a, not a great not a great way to go about that um, and uh, probably definitely a, a very big um, twisting of scripture to get that to track their argument basically follows from when Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians. The argument goes, well, the woman shouldn't withhold her body from the man. And it's like, yes, but also the man is the woman's body, and so she can also have a say-so in that, too. It goes both ways. Even nowadays, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I would strongly recommend, none of you guys are married, so it really doesn't matter, but I would strongly recommend not withholding, if you ever get married, I would strongly recommend not withholding sex from your partner. Partner, if they ever want to and you're just not in the mood, I would just go along with it anyways. Because it really starts to wear down on a marriage when there's a lack of intimacy. It really does. Um, being a pastor, there's a lot of stories I could tell you that, well, I, I don't really want to tell you, but just trust me on this. There's, there's stories, stories that I could tell you. And... Uh, or if you're gonna, if you if you're really not in the mood and you're really not wanting to do it, then then give like a promise, you know, like hey, kind of tired tonight. How about we do it tomorrow morning, or something like that, where there's like a hope in sight, because people tend to get kind of hurt, specifically about sexual things. It's kind of one of those very deep, very deep, and yeah, it's it's one of those things. Kind of a lot of issues to it. Anyways, uh, for uh, fifth off, um, not. Not bad sex. So what, what, what am I trying to say here? What's another way I could say that? Yeah, go ahead. Because I think the church has said some of the most shaming sort of things about like having sex with the wrong people. Right, right. Right. But that's not what I'm saying in this. I'm saying more of um, in the context of marriage, um, 
things that are immoral. That's another way. That's a better way of saying it. Things that are immoral shouldn't be done. So here's a big one I hear all the time. We watch porn while we're doing it. It it heightens the pleasure. Uh, okay, um, sure, but it's still an immoral thing. So God does still have rules for that. So it, you know, don't have bad things in your. And we are recording, so if you're gonna say something that's not good, don't do it. Um, so you know things that are. Um, things that are immoral. I, I should have put immoral instead of bad. Um, so things that are immoral shouldn't be in a marriage sex context. Wait. Yes, go ahead. Is it, that's also true. Oh, well, yeah, it's bad. What if you're married and uh, you, record, uh, you, you record yourself with each other and then you watch it? Same thing? No, it's not the same at all. The, when I'm talking about porn, I'm talking about between other people that you don't know. Like even like porn and porn, if you could do it with someone else besides your spouse. Does that kind of does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's not the only reason why it's wrong, but it's a big reason why it's wrong. Porn has a lot of reasons why it's wrong. A lot of reasons. You could fill a book mm -hmm. with all the reasons why you shouldn't look at porn. Anyways. Moving on to the moving on to the thing. Does anybody have any questions about that? Because I got one more slide about the whole G spot thing. Okay. No. Okay. Um, next off, pleasure doesn't decide morality, and I feel, I feel like this is kind of something that he doesn't really understand. I, to people like Ricky, morality is more based off of my opinions and my feelings. So homosexuality is okay because I feel that it is. Homosexuality is okay because I feel like if two people love each other, what's the problem? See, I mean, it, it's becomes it, it becomes not really a thing about, well, what does God say? It becomes a thing about, well, what do I say? And the problem with that, well, there's lots of problems with that. First off, we aren't the creators of morality. Second off, you know, a couple generations ago, everybody felt that homosexuality was wrong. So what happens in a couple more generations when homosexuality becomes wrong again? Like, where are we at then? <laughs> like, so, you know, pleasure doesn't really decide morality. So just the fact that homosexuals can hypothetically find a G-spot on a man better than straight people can, which I disagree with, that doesn't make it right. Kind of, you know, obvious there. Um, and then there's the last thing that I really want to say about this, and there's lots of other things I could say about this. I, I feel like I, you know, not there's no real no reason to. Um, sin is oftentimes a temptation. It's oftentimes pleasurable. You know, it feels good not to forgive somebody. It feels really good to hold on to that anger and that bitterness. It gives you all kinds of em senses of empowerment, and you get to ha. ha. You know, when you get really mad at someone, you just feel so powerful and so in control. It feels good. When you look at porn, oh, I, 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 oh, oh, it just, oh, I, oh, porn's so bad. No, porn feels great. While you're doing it. Yeah, cheating on your wife feels great. See what I mean? Like, there, there, there's things that, there's this idea that sin, sin is a no-no. If, if, if sin didn't feel good, you wouldn't be doing it. Doesn't that make sense? Like, if sin didn't feel good, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. You just, no, I'm good. There would be no temptation to sin because you wouldn't want to sin. Like, that makes sense to people. You guys get that, right? Like, sin is often a temptation. So the the fact of whether or not a homosexual can have better sex than a straight person, which, once again, I disagree with, but assuming that that is true, that doesn't really have a basis for whether or not people should be involved in a homosexual relationship. That makes sense, right? Like... You get what I'm saying, right? So what is wrong with God? This is the, one of the last things he said. And two things I want to say about that. First off, being flippant and disrespectful of others' beliefs is called intolerant. And a lot of times people level this against, Christ against Christians. Christians are so intolerant of other people. And, you know, oh, so that's okay when other people do it, but it's wrong if a Christian does it? So it's wrong for a Christian to say, totally fine, without, like, making fun of transgenders. That's not a thing. You're either born as a man or born as a woman, and this is proof of a mental issue that needs to be addressed. That is deemed as wrong, but it's 
totally okay to make fun of Christianity. Somebody's beliefs, God, all that stuff's fine. Seems like a bit of a double standard. I think it's funny, like, you can't make fun of other people's traditions, but, like, in, like, a really lyrical line about it, but then, like, you're like, oh, we can make fun of God, we can make fun of God. Yeah. And there was actually Ravi Zacharias, who I will admit had some was doing some very immoral things. However, he did say some very good things. And one of the things that he talked about was the way that everybody wants to do this nowadays. So you, I don't have to subject myself to your standard of what's right and wrong. You think homosexual is wrong? Is wrong? That's fine. Keep it to yourself. But you have to be subjected to my sense of right and wrong. So I think that this is how we should be living. So you have to agree with me. It's like, well... Now hold on, if you don't have to agree with me, then I don't have to agree with you, because if we're all our, e if we are all our own standard, and it's whatever I feel, then truth is relative, then everybody's truth is their own, which means my truth is equally the is equally as valid as your truth, which means you can't tell me that I'm wrong in wanting to kill a homosexual homosexual, which I don't, any more than I can tell you that homosexuality is is wrong. See, it's a draw. If that if that's the standard, then both of our points are equally valid. KKK isn't wrong either. See how that works? If truth is relative, then it's relative. It can't be relative when you want it to be relative, and then factual when it doesn't agree with you. Um, okay, so then the second thing about this whole what is wrong with God thing that he said. If God exists, the problem would reside with our understanding, not his actions. Okay, think about this. God creates morality. God creates standards. And then we get to ask him about that? No, no, no. If God does exist, which I'm obviously believing that he does, the problem is in my understanding of what he has said, not in what he has said. That means that there's nothing wrong with God. Rather, what is wrong with, with my understanding of what you said, God? There's a difference there. One goes to him like demanding the answers, expecting that I am the fount of, of, of right and wrong. I know. I've only existed, you know, a, a 30 years, 32 years, not even 20 years, 20 years. You know, and it's like, so God who existed, who, who invented time, exists outside of time, is subject to my very limited understanding of things. In the grand flock of, of knowledge of all the things knowable, we know such a small amount. And that doesn't even include the things that are unknowable. And that doesn't even, even include the things that our brains can't comprehend the ability of knowledge of. Think about that. Anyways, so why doesn't God just kill Satan? There's this great big, great big thing that he said. Okay, so first off, what is the source of evil? He said in the video it was Satan. Anybody want to take a, take a shot? Eli? No, on what is the source of evil? Anybody? Okay. Okay. So God created his evil. No, but I, I guess. So then I, something would have had to come before that made that heart corrupted then. Well, I. I So you're saying originally sor the source of evil is not the heart, but rather the free will. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And I would agree with you. Yeah. 100%. Um, that's what I meant. Yeah. We all are, were created with the chant with the option of choosing. And everybody wants to blame God for this one, right? Like, do you want to be made into a robot? No. But why doesn't God stop those people from doing something bad? So do you want to be made into a robot? No. I, I don't want him to change me. I'm perfect. But those people over there, the Jeffrey Damers of the world, they need God to wipe them out. And it's like, okay, so what you're not understanding is how evil you really are. That's the issue. We think that there's two kinds of people in the world, right? There's good people. Everybody's good. We're just all born good. And then there's the Jeffrey Damers, the, the people who are just weirdos. They don't fit the mold of how good and perfect we all are. So, God, I want you to intervene and kill all those people. It's like, meanwhile, God is saying... You didn't read the law, did you? I wrote, I gave you like 613 rules. Remember those? You just skipped past all of them. You're not getting the whole point. You are evil. <laughs> you. <laughs> not Jeffrey Damer over here and me over here. Here we all are. 
So if God was constantly intervening to kill everybody who was immoral and doing things that were wrong and thinking things that were wrong, first off, where is the line? Do they have to do it but not think it? So it's okay if, I, if I'm um, thinking about molesting children up here as long as I don't actually do it? I'm pretty sure we would all say no. You probably shouldn't be thinking about naked children up here either. Right? We would all say that, right? Okay. So if we can assume that our thoughts are also not a safe place, then I think that we can all say we have all had dark thoughts that should not have been there. Yes? Okay. So since we can say that, we can safely say that we were all deserving of death. Yes? So then we could safely say that there isn't two standards. And the reason why God ha didn't kill the Jeffrey Dames of the world is because we are all sinful in his sight. He had mercy on all of us. Just because he decided to have mercy on his creation, Jeffrey Dahmer, doesn't mean that he, you know, and I said that wrong. Just because he had mercy on that proves that he also is having mercy on us. See what I mean? You guys kind of get what I'm saying? Okay, so what is the source of evil? Our choices. God gave us free will. He didn't make us into robots. It's like he didn't make anybody in the world, Adolf Hitler or anybody, into robots. He gave everybody a choice. Now, he ultimately knows who will make what choice. He knew what Adolf Hitler was going to do before he did it. So why doesn't God just stop those people? Well, first off, in the absence of one, you'll find that another one will take the place. Okay? If there wasn't an Adolf Hitler, there would have been someone else. First off. Second off, if God removed people before they even had the choice to choose, then he couldn't really hold them accountable for something that they didn't actually do, could he? You sinned against me. How? Well, you were going to. Well, yeah, but God doesn't work like that, does he? So God, hypothetically, he could do that. Yeah, he could do that. And there'd be nothing you could say about it because he's God. However, that's not really how God operates. God gives us chances. How many times, for instance, has he told you personally to read your Bible and pray? How many times have you actually met that standard? And how many times has God squashed you for disobeying and for being bad? See what I mean? Um, for those of you who have been stuck in any kind of addictive behavior, drugs, sex, anything, um, how many times have you gone back to that thing and messed up and said, I'll never, never do it again? And then you do it again, and you feel guilty again. Right? And how many times has God just, like, flattened you out and said, you know what, I don't love you anymore? No, we guilt up ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Satan has a field trip with it. But even when God gets quiet in those times, he doesn't just disappear. So what is the source of evil? Our choices. We choose. Next off is our desires. James even goes as far. People in that Christians nowadays like to blame everything on Satan. And he did it too in the video. Uh, Satan's the, the source of bad. Satan made me do it. No, 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 no. James tells us in the book of James that the reason why we sin is because of our desires that are inside of us at war within us. We're fighting against the des desires that want to do the bad thing. Okay. So Satan doesn't do all the bad stuff. And pa passing off into Satan is kind of not really getting the whole idea god's patience mercy long suffering goes towards us as well so just as he, he has been patient in what he's what he's going to do with satan he also has been patient with us now satan can't can't repent satan can't be saved angels cannot be saved whether they're fallen or, or not demons are just angels that have fallen in case you didn't know that so they can't receive salvation they can't be brought to salvation we can Satan is screwed, okay, and God has still decided to show him mercy. So keep that in mind the next time that you think that you've fallen way too far and that God would never... Wait, how did you keep that just saying? Just in mind? He hasn't destroyed him yet. I wonder, I wonder why that just obviously... Well, I'm about to get to that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then the next thing is God doesn't enjoy punishment. He doesn't enjoy destruction. When Satan is brought to task, God is not going to enjoy doing that. Like, haha, finally I get to die. Ah. God is not, he's, that's not, that's not him. That's not him. Right. Well, no, he is wrathful. Um, he's not, his wrath is justified, first off. And second off, he's not petty and he's not yeah, revengeful. Yeah, revengeful. Okay. So, Maniacal. There's a there's a better word. He's not maniacal. I'm gonna stick with that one. I think it's better. Um, so, so like for instance, we read in the Old Testament where God says, "Okay, these people are dying." It, 
now, thousands of years later, oh, that's pretty callous. Well, keep in mind that he was patient for thousands of years. Like, for instance, in the part in Genesis where he's talking about, now, I'm, I'm not going to do this just yet, because I'm still going to give these people 400 more years to repent. Like, that's before Israel was even Israel. So this is kind of a big point that people skip over. He doesn't enjoy the punishment. First, next off, we don't exist in a vacuum. So God gives us an uh, opportunity to sin. If, if there was an opportunity to sin, there really wouldn't be any opportunity to obey and trust God. Makes sense, right? There is, we don't exist in a vacuum. God gives us the opportunity to sin. Removal of Satan wouldn't remove the problem. All it would do is remove Satan from the equation. That would be it. People would still be sinning. Okay, they would just be sinning in a different way. If uh, if the demonic didn't exist anymore, people wouldn't be getting into witchcraft anymore. They wouldn't be communicating with demons because there would be no demons to communicate with. But they would still be sinning in other ways. I think they'd sin in different ways. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I disagree. I, I think we'd sin the exact same amount, just with different things. So why doesn't he kill Satan? And uh, well, something that's kind of important. In the book of Revelation, we see this picture of everything that's laid out in the future with Satan and everything. And one thing that we see, which is inc incredibly important, is that God still has a purpose even in the even in the even in the destruction of of Satan. Literally, Satan's whole plan is laid out before God. He knows exactly what's going to happen. Which brings me to draw kind of an analogy, if you will. Just as Smeagol in The Lord of the Rings had a final role to play. Okay, in fact, Gandalf is talking with Frodo, and Frodo's like, well, well um, you know, we should just kill him. And Gandalf says, you know, you don't really know what somebody's role is going to be for good or for evil. You just, you really just don't know. And that's in the Fellowship of the Rings. Well, we get through the two towers, and he's still there, and we're in front of the king. And finally, at the very end, he's done all this treachery, tried to kill Frodo and Sam. He ends up trying to steal the ring one last time from Frodo, bites off his finger, and falls into the lava in, in Mount Doom and dies. And because of him, the ring was destroyed. And that's one of the things we see in Revelation is Satan raging against God, trying to, ah, and then in the end, all of Satan's raging just fulfilled what God wanted to do. See what I mean? It brought about what, so so just as Smeagol, Satan still has a role to play, unwittingly subjected to God's will, thinking that he's, you know, so smart and everything, and the whole time God's playing him like a violin. So things aren't in our timing. Why doesn't God kill Satan? Because it's not in our timing. God will do what God does in his time. I mean, this is something that we have to be okay with. The majority of your life, you're going to be waiting for something really spectacular to happen, only to realize that God had his own time frame. And the quicker you learn in your life to accept God's time frame rather than your own, the way less frustrated you'll be. Good is often accomplished through evil. Now, let me kind of clarify what I mean. I'm not saying that God causes bad things to happen for the sake of a good result. If you've read the book Dune, it's kind of a philosophy science fiction book, but one of the big points of the book Dune is whether evil actions justify a positive result. Paul Atreides, who is the Muad'Dib of the Fremen in the movie or the book, whichever one you prefer, um, he, he causes this galaxy-wide genocide millions of people slaughtered and the reason why he does it is because it's the only way to save humanity from killing themselves and he was able to see this because of tripping on a drug called spice uh, but back to reality that's a science fiction book that's not based in reality so back to reality god i'm not saying that about god god isn't the god isn't, isn't the guy up there who's like well i'm gonna do a bunch of bad stuff but in the end it'll be good no he takes the bad things that he did know that would happen, and he gives meaning to them as we subject ourselves to him. So what that means is we obey God, we serve him. Bad things happen in life. He then intervenes in those bad things to produce a good result. Things like sicknesses, things like the death of loved ones, things that caught you by surprise that God was not caught by surprise. He works them to a good result. And why is that important to distinguish that? Because I refuse to teach or believe that God makes bad things happen, that he is evil at his core and causes bad things to happen. 
if it is true that God causes bad things to happen for good, then that ultimately means that God is not a moral God because who sinned in the, in the Garden of Eden? It wasn't Adam and Eve. It was God who made them sin. See the difference? Go ahead. It's not the verse that says that we have the prophet Malachi that says how the kingdom of peace will be through the torn leaven. So that's that's the translation issue is you're not you're not really reading in a in a translation that translates that very well. You probably read that in either the KJV or something similar to the KJV. It's more of this is how how it kind of this is how it says in the King James. God causes peace and he also causes evil that's how it reads in the king james the idea is more like god brings times of peace and he also brings times of of well punishment and the context for that if you'll if you'll remember what isaiah is prophesying about he brought peace to the nation of israel they refused to obey so he instead he caused the syrians to come up and conquer them and some very bad things to happen Cause that to happen. Now that was an evil. That was punishment. It would have been evil if there was no cause for it, and he did it for pleasure. Yeah, I, I knew. I knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. Right. So that would be the solution to that. Is that is not talking about God doing something bad or immoral. God is the God is the one who's doing things behind the court in the curtains at all times. We always think that he's like. We're waiting for him to move, but he's moving it all, all, all the time with all kinds of different things. So one thing that we see is, it looks like you were about to say something. Uh, I wanted to comment. Mm -hmm. Kind of my big break with the issue was that I was I was I was basically told that all my pain that I was going through with my RA, with you know losing family members, you know, with all that, it's being used for God's glory. Uh huh. And it's like, oh, so I'm not suffering the pain. God sees it. He knows it's happening. He's not letting it go, but he's using it. You know, you really should have. You really should start coming to Sunday to Sunday again. Uh, la my last my last series was literally talking about that thing you just said. And the series before that was talking about it too, about the way that you know we all as Christians, whether we're in ministry or not. You know, that we're going through these things and it's not pointless and all these different things about the, the, the things that... You should really just start coming on Sundays again. Whatever you're doing on Sundays, stop doing and come. Come on. Come on. Do it. Maybe this is God's way to tell me. Come back. Come back. <laughs> Please come back. <laughs> so, um, anyways, uh, a, a good example of what I mean by this is... So somebody gets sick, right? And then, through that sickness... They're able to encourage someone else. Someone loses something very dear to them. And through that loss, they're able to speak life into somebody else. See what I mean? And um, so the example that's always brought up is the example of Job. So there's a few things that are worth mentioning. First off, God antagonized Satan. I'll, say, I'll use that word for lack of a better word. Into what he said about Job. If you read through it, Job's going in there, he's like kind of, you know, I'm not, Job, Satan's going in there, he's kind of like, you know, just talking or whatever, and God's like, yeah, but did you see, did you see my servant Job? He brings up Job. Satan doesn't bring up Job. And he did, he did that knowing what Satan was going to do and saying. And then he allowed Satan to do the thing. Okay. Did God do it or did Satan do it? Satan did it. God allowed it. The difference being, if God would have just been like, Job, this is going to be really fun. That dies. You get sick. Ah, ah. You know, it, that's not God. God's not an evil God. Okay? So it might seem like tripping over hairs, but in those hairs is a world of difference. Because if God, God is not, God is not causing those, he wasn't causing those evil things to happen to Job, but he did allow it, and he did instigate it. Okay? These are all important distinguish, distinguishing things to do. So Satan... Um, not knowing it, was used by God. Now, why would God do that to Job, who was a perfect person? Well, because Job wasn't perfect. It says he was upright. He was still a, sin a sinful person in need of a Savior. The words are different. So, he was, a, he, was, he, was a, and he was an upright person, 
who God used to show him who he really was. And at the end of the book, Job finally has his breakthrough moment. He comes face to face with God just as he wanted, and he says this, I had heard about you. I was going through the motions. I understood what I was doing, but now now I, I'm having a realization of who you are. I'm seeing you, and I'm, I'm sorry. My bad. I'm just going to go ahead and close my mouth now. He, he, he got it. You know what I mean? So God used something to teach Job about who he really was and give him a real revelation. Here's the thing, okay? God is still trying to give us those revelations of his character. These bad things, they aren't just bad things that are happening in your life. They're opp opportunities in your life to know God in a deeper way. All of them. Every single one of them. But that one really hurt. Yeah, I agree. I've been through some real bad doozies. But God is doing this thing where he's raising our pain threshold so that we can reach more people. Were you going to say something? God wouldn't have antagonized Satan into doing it. Because <laughs> obviously, like, he gave, he, he, he gave Job the choice to not do it. Right. You know, he, he, he wanted to keep him safe. Well, I think if he would have, it wouldn't have really changed anything. Because think about it. God would have still been able to teach Job. Nothing would have changed. He would have still gone through the things. God would have still used it. Like maybe, maybe he wouldn't have been restored as strong as he was in the beginning. I don't know. I mean, God doesn't heal us because we're we handle every situation perfect, right? I mean, I've been through some really bad situations I deserved, and I didn't get, I deserve for God to work in me after the afterwards, and yet God still is. I mean. I feel like it'd be less. It would be less encouraging. It would be. But remember that Job, a lot, a large part of the book of Job is to point forward to the coming Christ. So we would still get a picture of Christ. That's all that matters. One thing that uh, I uh, have been thinking about a lot lately, and I, I know we're, we're done, we're done. But um, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is uh, the way that we can compare our sufferings to Christ, and it puts things in perspective. Like, here's a good example, right? Like, I, I, I was betrayed by somebody who I really trusted or really cared about. Jesus was betrayed too. Well, I, I'm really having to, having to struggle. I'm in a lot of pain. Jesus was in a lot of pain too. Well, you know, I see what I mean? Everything that you can possibly say, Jesus was there. He he went through it too. Like you, you can compare anything that you're going through. Like even take people who have like you know like us who have physical pain almost constantly. Jesus, it said that it says that Jesus lived under the under the shadow of the cross, under the weight of what was what was what he was doing his whole life. He knew, so he had to carry around that anxiety on him all the time of what was happening, what was going to happen. He wasn't like, oh, I didn't see this one coming. And this was over his whole life seeing this terrible thing that he was about to, about to have to go through. So, I mean, and then what was his response to it, though? Well, he, it says that he didn't, he, he, he didn't, he didn't shy away from it. He rather looked forward to what was coming after it. And we can do something, basically the same thing, like, yeah, we are suffering now, but we can look forward to the hope of glory and what's coming next. See what I mean? The older I get, the more I understand that, 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 the, the next life and it's not something to be afraid of it's it's what we're all secretly wanting in the depth of our heart if you think real hard about it it's going to scare you don't think too hard about it just trust your heart on this one your heart says that it's looking for a place of peace where you don't have to keep going through the problems all the time where you don't have people letting you down where you don't have all this that's heaven like you are literally describing your heart's ache for heaven so instead of letting your brain make you afraid of heaven and, uh, and all the things that are going to happen and all that, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. 
is what your heart is wanting the whole time. It's like when a kid is 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 scared to go to the dentist, but if he doesn't go to the dentist, he's gonna be in a world of pain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's kind of like that. It's, it's one of those things where like you think you don't want to do this, but you actually do. Like in cookies, if you're the chiropractor, like you don't just go to the chiropractor once and you're done with it. Just like in the same way, you don't go to the dentist once and you're done. Mm-hmm. You have to keep going. Back. Would I have to go to the dentist again? You didn't tell me that. <laughs> so next week we're gonna we're gonna look at um, why I trust the Bible. I think we're in chapter twelve on that now.